Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. You know, I think this is going to be a really special episode. Um, it's something that is, is very personal to so many of us in the nonprofit sector. And we are really fortunate, Sherry Quam Taylor and I, to have Alex Schwartzstein come on and talk about a very personal issue in her life and battle. And we're going to be talking about this in the context of working through cancer treatments and how we as professionals in our sector um, have to keep doing our work and our jobs. And what does that look like? And so, Alex, wow, I am so taken with your um, willingness to share with us and talk about this. Um, I think you're brave in just this part of your life, just to actually witness to us what it's like. And so I want to just say personally, you know, thank you, thank you very much for doing this with us on the nonprofit show. Oh, well, thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, after going through this three times, I consider myself sort of like a professional cancer patient. So <laughs> I'm really happy to, if there's any benefit I can gain from the horrible stuff mm -hmm. that I've been through and sharing that knowledge with other people, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to take whatever good I can from it. Wow. Well, you're a warrior and, you know, uh, I think that and Sherry, I would love your feedback on this, but I think people in fundraising are warriors, mm -hmm. right? It's a tough, tough job. And so maybe there's some nexus there between um, your personal journey and your professional journey. And I can't wait to explore it because I, I, I find it just absolutely fascinating. Um, we are so fortunate to have the support of our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're here with the amazing Sherry Quam Taylor, CEO of Quam Taylor. She is one of our co-hosts, as I am Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Okay, the big guest of the day here is the wonderful Alex Schwartzstein, coming to us from the Bay Area, your fundraising consultant of Mission Mavens. Love that name for a business. No. Thank you. It's amazing. Talk to us about your journey into fundraising and, and how you became a professional fundraiser. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so I... Um, I was, let's see, I was 23. I had been working at a job that was just not right for me. And because I was 23, as we're all really smart at that age, I left the job with no prospects. <laughs> um, and I was trying to figure out what the heck is it that I actually want to be doing. And, um, I realized at some point, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to be in the nonprofit world. And at the time I was living in Manhattan, I, you know, had no money. Um, I, yeah. I was looking at jobs and I, and I saw the program jobs. Well, those weren't going to pay my rent. And I saw all well, the development jobs. Those are closer to paying my rent. Uh, <laughs> and then when I thought harder about it. I realized it was actually something I'd always been doing. Um, raising money for things, championing causes was just who I was. And then I was like, wait, I can get paid to do that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and found my way into a development assistant job at a major university in New York City. I love this. You know, Sherry, don't you think that this is somewhat of a thread that we hear from folks? I always tell people, um, I mean, it's, me too. It's like, uh, wait, how, did I, how am I over here on fundraising? Like, I, I mean, I said to somebody yesterday, even I said, I can count on one hand of 13 years of my business, people who said, well, actually, I've been trained in this. You know, everybody else is, well, I was of this and now I thought I'd try it. Or I grew up through a, a totally different part of you know, of, of the world. And now I'm a fundraiser. So I feel like these are the happy accidents uh, for relational people. And um, so I'm glad to be in, in this circle with, with Alex. You know, and I loved what you said, you know, bringing back into the, the relationship piece of this. And uh, Alex, it's really prophetic what you said, you know, you're like, when you step back, you're like, wow, I've always been doing this. It's just been natural, you know, I've been championing causes and helping raise money, and I've been a part of that. And so um, how fortunate are we in, in our uh, ecosystem of the nonprofit world to have you in it doing this work? Let's uh, get into the more serious part and have you 
if you don't mind, share with us your very private and personal story and that journey, because you're a very young woman. <laughs> That's true. I'll be 40 yeah. next month. <laughs> very young. Very young. Very young. Um, yeah. So I mentioned I was a development assistant in, in early 2008. And within less than a year on that job, I was diagnosed with synovial sarcoma. Um, that is my cancer number one. It is extremely rare. It is considered pediatric, in fact. Um, and it is so rare that they only have these, you know, horrible barbaric treatments for it. And they just certainly 15 years ago, um, mm -hmm. I had to go through um, inpatient rounds of chemotherapy every three weeks. And they did not have the kind of drugs they have now to, man to manage nausea. Um, I had to go through major surgery on my knee and also radiation at the end. So nine months of treatment. Um, I, I was diagnosed just shy of my 24th birthday. Um, <laughs> mm. And um, at that time in my life, you know, in your early 20s, people don't know how to handle big life things mm. like this. And I didn't want to be treated like I was made of glass, right? Um, I knew people would treat me differently if they knew. So I only told at work the people who had to know. And in my you know, people were close to me in my personal life. Uh, I wore a wig the whole time. And I wanted any part of my time and my body that was my own uh, to feel just totally normal the whole time. And as soon as I was done with treatment, I moved on and was like, I never have to think about cancer again, but <laughs> joke was on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fast forward to December, 2022, I'm living back in the Bay area. I'm originally from California. Um, oh. I was director of development and communications for a large behavioral health nonprofit here, um, and found out that I had vaginal cancer metastatic. Mm -hmm. Um, so I said, oh, okay. Like I used to make the joke of like, well, what? I'm not going to get cancer twice. And uh, that's not the case. Wow. So um, I had to go through two months of intensive, what I call chemo light um, and radiation, which was the primary treatment. Um, pelvic radiation is about as fun as that sounds. Um, so I took two months leave from work. I was open. I was in a different place in my life. So I was open with the people at work on my team. I shared with them what was happening. It helped that I had a team that was entirely female, so it was easier to talk about mm. having a gynecological yeah. cancer. Right. Um, right. And in my personal life, you know, I was a much more established, so I was able to share it with the people who were in my life. Um, and I was told that there was a 75% chance I'd be cured after that treatment. And um, about nine months later, I found out that I was in the 25%. So mm. um, in January of this year, I found, I got confirmation that my cancer had recurred. Um, and I went through about five months of intensive chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can see from my hair, I finished the chemo a little while ago, but the immunotherapy, the immunotherapy is something I have to be on potentially indefinitely. Um, so mm -hmm. I've to a point where I've now accepted that cancer is an ongoing part of my life. And um, mm -hmm. while at 24, I wanted it to have nothing to do with my identity. At this point in my life, I've accepted that it's unavoidable and I'm just embracing it. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. And um, I have so many questions and, and so many um, thoughts on this. Um, my first thought is what a change that you've seen in science and technology um, from that first episode. Um, and how has that changed your, your opinion about fundraising and the hope aspect and, and along with the grind, because a lot has changed in that short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, a lot has changed in cancer treatment. I mean, mm -hmm. I had radiation in 2009 and, and then I had radiation again in 2023 and the machines look completely different. Um, they are so much more targeted and I'm so glad that the time that I had it more targeted and careful was the time it was, you know, dealing with my abdomen and the other time was with my knee. Uh, <laughs> I want more precision when we're dealing with, you know, major organs. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned, the drugs now also are much, much better. Now they give you steroids and there's almost no nausea. Like the media portrayal of what, you, what a person going through chemo looks like is not really accurate anymore uh, because wow. Um, you have a drug, they really have got a lot of great drugs to control the nausea. Now everyone experiences it differently. I think I've had an easier time than some others and age certainly plays a factor. Um, younger people, I think tend to have an easier time, um, sure. for sure. And, and not easy, just easier relatively. Of course. Right. Alex, right. I feel like same with Julia. I was like, wait, I have, I have so many questions, but I also catch myself like not knowing what question to ask mm -hmm. or what is appropriate or like, 
pop? You know, do you feel like, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, do, do you feel like you just get all sorts of responses to like the silent nervous or someone who's maybe on the other end of the spectrum asking too many questions and like, how do you navigate? Like, that's um, private to me or, you know, what, what can be public and what's private? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. You're touching on a whole lot of things. Um, I... It's interesting. I mean, having been through this three times, I have the first time I was super, super private about it, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to treat me differently. The second time I was pretty open. And this third time now, I've come to a point where I'm just, it's out there. Um, at this point, I just want everyone to know because it's easier than me having to tell them. Yes. Um, oh. um, that's that's the hardest part, actually, is letting people know for the first time what's going on. You get to a point where you say, can you just tell all the other people so I don't have to tell like mm -hmm. when I'm going through this? Um, answering questions or having people who don't know what to say is fine. It's actually um, sometimes people say things that are well-meaning but aren't super helpful. We live, I mean, we live in a culture that has really toxic positivity. Um, mm. and, um, and I think the best responses are just the kind of questions that are open-ended and leave, you know, and are interested in what I'm going through um, in my unique experience because everyone experiences this differently. Sure, sure. Well, that positive, that toxic positivity, I'm like pausing on that. I'm like, mm -hmm. am I doing that? You know, just because mm -hmm. it's dismissive you know, mm -hmm. to say, you know, I see you have a positive attitude, but you, I, I can't imagine your days are all, you know, sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> like, exactly. I, what I can imagine. I'm no. positive today, but I'm also I've been feeling great since, you know, chemo was over a couple months ago. Right. Of course I feel great because I felt like crap a few months ago. So now in contrast, I feel amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah interesting. Well, talk to us about the lessons that you've learned. I mean, I, I thought, what you said was really fascinating to start off with is that you know as a young woman in your 20s there's a lot going on anyway and you're learning you're learning a lot and then you have to add this this new challenge what have been some of the the things that have come through on this i would imagine that are still coming through uh yeah um well we all know the lessons we learn the best are the are the ones that we've had to learn the hard way and there is yeah. no hard way like cancer treatment so i have learned a lot of things yeah. that i did not necessarily want to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the biggest one and the most obvious one is how to ask for help or how to accept help um wow. i mean learning that in my 20s I, I think was invaluable um so many people take a really long time to learn how to let other people in and that like no one can get through life alone well when you are feeling like crap because you're you know nauseous and lying in bed and you need someone to like bring you food from the kitchen that's like 10 feet away that's when you learn i have to accept help i don't have a choice um so that's yeah, yeah you know, just, go ahead yeah, i'm just gonna say i'm just like literally going wait what was i doing at 24 mm -hmm. and I'm, like i'm just thinking like Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little bit older than you now, but like, it's like, I can just, I mean, I'm a different human now that I was at 24. And I'm just thinking like, I can imagine, um, you know, these two diagnoses or three diagnoses, like uh, played out so differently based on your age. I'm just like I'm kind of marinating in that. Yeah. I'll tell you also um, the idea of asking for help. It's really, I mean, speaking of fundraising, it's really changed my mentality. Um, hmm. I, it's it's made me really believe strongly in the concept of mutual aid as opposed to charity because charity is something you do for those needy people over there. There's a stigma associated. There's that otherness, but mutual aid is recognizing we all have needs at different points in our lives, and we can all help each other during those different points. And there's nothing that makes you recognize that like being on the needing end of something. Mm -hmm. um, I and that is completely the philosophy behind what I do. Wow. You know, of all the things that I thought you might say, this was never in that uh, in that view of mine. I, you know, um, because I try to think, I try to anticipate, like, what are the responses going to be to our questions and our discussion? So I can, it's my way of preparing, and that never ever entered my mind. And so I'm fascinated by that um, because I can see as a as a professional fundraiser and. And you are a CFRE, so you're an educated professional fundraiser. 
um, that this would become something that you would learn and then it would factor in. Another thing I was thinking about from this is I wonder, did it ever or has it impacted your view of what you will fundraise for? Have you become more interested in cancer related topics or medical topics? Or could you pick up and work for a cultural institution tomorrow? Like, how has this changed your your view of things? Interesting. I would say um, for a long time, not at all. Um, my my sweet spot is really health and human services, and it always has been um, because my philosophy about fundraising is I believe everyone needs to take care of their own backyard. And I don't think that has anything to do with my cancer experience. That's just who I am and what I believe in. I think you know, believe, taking care of your local community-based organizations first is ever, should be everyone's first priority. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, mm -hmm. and if we all did that, the world would be a better place. Uh, right. But uh, and, you know, I mentioned after my 20s, you know, for a long time, I just, I wanted to steer clear of anything cancer related. It never occurred to me to work for a cancer organization. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But now that I have cancer, you know, indefinitely, um, I would say I feel very differently. Um, because I am living and breathing and thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it would feel much more natural now. Yeah. And, sure. and you would just hear things that, that that someone who had not had your experiences like can't hear. Like you just have a different lens, a different, I can imagine, um, you know, I, I have similar experiences to it, like things I've gone through. And I think like, I know exactly what you're talking about without even saying it. So right. I, I just feel like there has to be this, um, different lens that you're seeing these challenges through, no matter what type of cancer somebody might be might be facing. Yeah, it seems uh, it seems like you're a more educated fundraiser for this topic. I mean, would yeah, you, absolutely. No question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that your empathy has changed or the way that you receive empathy from donors or when you're in that conversation, how has that changed? Oh yeah, um, I mean, all major, like anyone who's been through major or chronic illness has something in common. There is a shared experience for sure. Um, and it, I would say most of all, it, makes, it has made me, you know, even as a young person able to relate to people of all ages because by a certain age, most everyone has been through some life experience with this, either themselves or a loved one. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely have the empathy for someone going through something really difficult um, at a much younger age than most. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, and I've, I've, I've formed some very deep connection. I actually had donors from my last job, um, even after I had left, um, who are I'm still very close friends with. I had one who you know sent me flowers every week of my treatment, which was so sweet. Oh my goodness, I love it. Have you felt? And before we move on, I I, I want to ask the empowerment issue and because you do seem so positive and upbeat and, and front facing and transparent. Did you ever feel like your relationships with your donors shifted or changed towards you and away from the mission that you were supporting or talking about? And how did you deal with that? I don't think so. Um, I mean, because I'll tell you another of the big lessons that I've learned from this is that it is how to be vulnerable and bring others along on my journey. Um, it, I think when you're vulnerable and you open yourself up to someone, mm -hmm. you're building a connection and a bridge or strengthening a connection that was already there in a way that you really can't otherwise. Um, and it builds community. Um, I, I find that when I've had donors that I'm close enough to that I share what, was, what I was going through, usually the response was, oh my gosh, similar experience with my wife or my father, right. or I mean, immediately people can relate to cancer. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it's touched everybody at this point i feel like and it's kind of an sometimes it might be an open door for somebody who needs to talk about it and maybe isn't as open uh, you know so i feel like it's almost therapeutic um, to have that shared experience mm -hmm. yeah Definitely. very interesting well and, and sherry to your point talk to us about the empowerment aspect um i mean i i would say you're still a young woman growing and changing and learning your trade and your craft and then you have this major upheaval that's layered in, which will transform anyone. Um, how did you turn that into empowerment or where did you find empowerment with this? Um, yeah, so I, I spent a long time sort of working and planning toward becoming a consultant. I knew that it was my goal for a long time um, mm -hmm. because 
I, I've been used as all of my strengths. I'm, you know, I'm great at problem solving and critical thinking and giving. I love coaching and advising. And um, I just, I thought that I would know the magical time that it was right for me to go and do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, last year, when I came back to work after treatment, after those two months, um, first of all, I came back way too fast, which had nothing to do with my team. They were wonderful. They covered for me. They never, ever made me feel like I was needed. But, you know, all of us in the nonprofit sector have this mindset of scarcity. Yeah. And like we all, especially since COVID, have worn so many hats. I mean, I knew I was needed. They didn't have to say it or protect me from it for me not to know like I'm needed. So I came back out of a sense of obligation that was something I entirely put on myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out pretty quickly that I really couldn't live up to the same very high standards I'd set by myself previously. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really forced to reckon with my burnout. Um, mm -hmm. which I think is something a lot of people in the nonprofit sector are really, it's, you know, seeing a lot of it right now, people doing that, but I was forced to last year from this situation. I had to and look and say, this isn't sustainable for me anymore. And I need to find a better way for me to work. Mm -hmm. So, um, last fall, I said, this is what I'm going to do. I talked with my employer. I turned them into a client. I helped guide them through, um, slightly you know, restructuring the department for the next chapter, finding my replacement. Um, I had another lead kind of fall in my lap. That was really wonderful. Um, and I was able to really branch out on my own and become a consultant advising nonprofits on fundraising strategy, long-term planning. Um, and interestingly, <laughs> when I, when my recurrence happened early this year, you know, I'd only been a consultant, like a few months. Um, mm -hmm. and weirdly enough, the cancer treatment freed me to be able to do something that I think as a new consultant, I otherwise wouldn't have felt like I could do, which is to focus on only accepting work that was the right fit for me. Uh -huh. So good. Interesting. So good. So. Yeah, I hear you. I feel like um, there's the myth of like, well, you're starting just if it if if it's money, you got to take it, you know, <laughs> so um you know, you're 13 in my consultancy, I can say, well, I, I work with people I want to work with, but like, I love that, um, that freedom or almost that you were given to say, it's better be worth it for me to give my time to this because you're doing some other pretty important things. I love yeah. it. And the, the other thing it's sort of, um, I mean, which I would say being on this show as part of is it's this, at least this last time around, um, I felt empowered to really use my story to, I frankly enhance my own visibility um, <laughs> in a weird way. I've sort of come to a point where I accept I've had this like horrible experience, whatever benefit I can get out of it, the universe kind of owes me. <laughs> um, right. Ooh, you know, yeah. I can help other people along the way. That's fantastic. Um, I was talking with a friend, another nonprofit consultant last week. In fact, I was sort of joking about how I'm like exploiting my own experience to my benefit. And she was like, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs> Um, like, and I was like, well, if I was using, if I was doing this with someone else's story, I'd consider it explaining. She's like, right, but it's yourself. So that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. so that was helpful Ooh. for me to read it. I love that. I do too. I, I find that very refreshing and extremely honest. Um, and so I appreciate, and I actually applaud you for saying that because I think it actually makes you much more approachable as a thought leader. Um, because a lot of times in consultancy, you know, we we come across like we know everything and we're empowered and we try and build confidence, but we haven't really been in that trench with that nonprofit or with that topic. And so I think this is a cool thing. I really do. I think it's um, I think it's bravo to you for for saying I'm going to embrace this. Right. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, we work so hard, whether it's a, whether you're coaching a fundraiser or a consultant or anybody um, like to show up as ourselves. Like, oh, we, we just need to be ourselves. That's it, the best show up as the best, best version of yourself. This is your story. And so I feel like it is, is truly you are owning your authentic self, you know, whether, you know, obviously you didn't want this to be part of your story, but it is. And so I, I applaud you for for owning every aspect of yourself and letting us see that and, and learn from you um, through this journey. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Well, Sherry mentioned this right off the top of the show. She's like, you know, I don't know what to say. I, I how do I respond? Do I do I head in? Do I ask you your question? Do I say Make the wrong thing? <laughs> Yeah, no joke. I mean, there's, and especially women, you know, yeah. women get like into the weeds of how you're going to live your life and what can they do. 
hence the casserole. You know, what would you tell us? Like, how can we be better, you know, parts of your puzzle or anyone's puzzle in supporting them when they're dealing with a major illness? Um, well, I would say certainly for nonprofit employers behaving the way that the employers that I've had during these times did, which was to be really, you know, I've talked about it. everyone's unique and every illness is unique, right? Like I acted really differently with each of my different experiences. So just allowing someone to be as flexible as they need to. The first time I had cancer, I worked like 50% of the time. I was going into the office on the subway every day because we had different ideas about germs back in 2008. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, Right. And my and my supervisors, like I was just a development assistant and there was no work from home, but they still they let me know, like they let me decide when my body was up to coming in and to do whatever I felt like I could do and to go home if I needed to go home. Um, but this last time, you know, I. I thought I was going to like last year, I thought I was going to work a little bit throughout my leave, but I found out within a week that was not going to happen because my body was not up for it. I just took two months of solid leave and my employer was super supportive of that. Like I said, my team covered for me. Um, they were really wonderful about it. Um, this year would have been much harder if I hadn't been self-employed, I would say, because um, it was such a longer amount of time that I was just feeling up and down. But um, yeah, just having that flexibility and grace to know that no two people deal with cancer the same and the same person doesn't deal with two cancers the same um, or any major illness. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. How do you feel about people um, engaging on a personal level, like asking the question like, you know, is today a good day or a bad day or or bringing the topic back up? Or do you feel like it's it's been healthier not to talk about it. What what has that looked like for you? Um, so this is one of those lessons that I learned um, the first time. The first time I shut down any conversation about it because I just wanted to pretend everything was normal. And I and the only I was very happy about the fact that the only person who ever sent me a get well soon card were my grandparents. They got they got the best. <laughs> Nobody else was allowed to ask me how are you feeling. Um, right. What I figured out last year was I created a WhatsApp group. Um, for anybody who wanted to know what was going on in my life. And I said, look, I know that you all care about me, but it can be really emotionally overwhelming to get a bunch of different texts and messages all over the place from really well-meaning people. Um, and to have to think about this at times when I don't, when I'm not already thinking about it. So I'm gonna create this one channel where I will share updates for all of you. And that's where you can ask me questions about this. You can talk to me otherwise about anything else, but about my illness, this, this is the place for that. Um, and Love that. Yeah, I mean, so again, everyone's different. I would say it's, the question that you just asked is a really respectful and thoughtful question to ask anyone going through a major illness. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel, Sherry, I don't know about you, but I would say at times in my life, and even right now, you know, I go to work to get away from the crapola in my life. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I, I don't, know. yeah, it, I, I'll be honest. I mean, it's, I'm not worrying about being a wife or a mother or, a, you know, uh, managing my home. I'm, when I go to work, I'm in a different place and a different mindset. So then to be pulled back into something, um, I can see would be, you know, a tough thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that we don't talk enough about, um, how cancer and any major illness has a huge mental health component. I mean, cancer or major illness, it's a trauma. Yeah. And like any trauma and, and worse than that, like it's, I mean, or like any trauma, like while you're going through it, you can't process it, right? And cancer, when you get a cancer diagnosis, you get into treatment like that. There is no one I have ever met who's like, I got cancer and the doctor said, come in a few months for treatment. It's usually like everything <laughs> happens immediately. And you're still trying to figure out what the heck is happening, how to like manage all of your appointments and everything and medications. Uh, and then, and by the time you think you've figured it out, the treatment part is over. And that's when you can actually start to process what the hell just happened to me. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so, you know, just acknowledging that anybody who's been through this is not going to be the same either physically or mentally after. Um, and it can take a while to get through that aftermath. Yeah. And, wow. and it's different for everybody. And so let it be different for everybody. Yeah. I love that, Sherry. Well, Alex Schwartzstein, you've been just a marvel. And I really enjoyed that you would um, have this conversation with us and you would let us ask you questions and something that is perilous and frightening and unknown and that um, you have three different perspectives because you've done this three different times over the trajectory of a very young life. And so I really, really appreciate that you would come on the nonprofit show 
and and talk to us about this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate having this forum. Yeah, it's been great. Sherry, you know, you and I are mothers. We know these things, uh, you know, in the trajectory of taking care of other women. And uh, it's a really profound conversation, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. I um, And I love that uh, just I feel like it's always such a wide range of topics, Julia. And that's what I love about this show. It's like uh, we just I feel like it's I didn't know I needed this today. Let me say that. <laughs> oh, thank you. To both oh my days. God, you made my day. I, I have to say, that's a cool thing to, to hear. I didn't know I need, I, I think that's about me too. Oh my I didn't know yeah. I needed this. You're inspiring yeah. us, Alex, of just your strength. It's, it's really inspiring. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a cool thing, Alex. Well, you've made two new friends today who uh, continue to, will be continuing to think about you and supporting you. Um, just as we have major support from our sponsors, they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join in with us when, every day. And, and Sherry mentioned it. It's never two days or never the same. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what's absolutely um, wonderful. Alex, we end every episode with this mantra, and today it it's how appropriate strikes me to the core. And the message goes like this: to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you, ladies.